Hi folks, my name is Tim Sweeney. Uh, I'm here to present the first of a series of webinars that I'm in Fanatics about sepsis diagnostics and the power of the host response in profiling and creating new information for your clinical practice. Topics of today's webinar will be the clinical need. Um, what can we do uh, for suspected acute infections and sepsis that can provide actionable information in the clinic? A little bit of background on antibiotic overuse and the limitations of pathogen testing. Um, then the general power of the host response. And finally, just a couple of slides on Inflamatix's INCEPT testing solution, which is not yet FDA cleared. The common problem that we see in practice all the time is the question of whether or not to prescribe antibiotics. A couple of years ago, in February of 2019, the New England Journal put together this case study that I thought was very informative um, about a 72-year-old woman who presents with a one-day history of left lower quadrant pain. She has a history of constipation, but also of urinary retention. And her exam is notable for a little bit of tachycardia, and she's tender in the left lower quadrant. Lab results show a uh, white blood cell count of 24,000 with a left shift, uh, a little bit of hemoconcentration, and a moderate lactate of 3.9. CT shows a large amount of stool without evidence of edema or hypoenhancement, and she has a lot of urinary retention. Two separate physicians weighed in in a point and counterpoint way to figure out whether or not to administer antibiotics. Michael Klompas took the position, do not administer antibiotics to this woman, pointing out both that the data are equivocal for early antibiotics for patients who have sepsis, but without shock. Also, that leukocytosis itself is not specific to infection. About 50% of ED patients with white blood cell count of 12 and a half to 25,000 have non-infectious conditions. On the other hand, Laura Evans points out the potential risk of withholding therapy is very high. And if a potential further workup is negative for infection, it's always possible to de-escalate antibiotics. That said, antibiotics can harm patients and are hard to de-escalate once prescribed. We know that antibiotic overuse can contribute to population antimicrobial resistance. C. diff infections, and a perturbed microbiome. Moreover, JAMA Internal Medicine noted that about one in five patients treated with IV antibiotics experiences a directly attributable adverse drug event. These drugs are not free. Furthermore, a recent prospective multinational observational study of almost 1,500 ICU patients receiving empiric antibiotics found that only 16% were ever de-escalated, despite most having no evidence of a pathogen found in microbiology. Thus, the plan to eventually de-escalate is just often not borne out in clinical practice. So what are we left with in terms of being able to diagnose infections? Well, the most common we think about, of course, is the blood culture. But the problem with existing diagnostics like blood cultures is that most infections aren't bloodstream infections. In the U.S., about a million patients a year are diagnosed with sepsis. But of those patients, less than half have a positive blood culture. The majority of patients with sepsis have a locally held skin and soft tissue infection, belly infection, or pneumonia that doesn't penetrate the bloodstream. And while that may be true for patients with sepsis, in a general population presenting to the emergency department with a suspected acute infection, the problem is much greater. If you looked at the roughly 15 million patients per year or so who are seen in the ED with a suspected acute infection, of those retrospectively judged to have a bacterial infection, only about 10% ever have a positive blood culture. In other words, a positive blood a Positive blood culture may indicate an infection if it's not contamination, but a negative blood culture really doesn't rule out the need for antibiotics. It's not just blood cultures. A case series in New England Journal in 2015 looked at 2,300 patients with a radiographically confirmed pneumonia and found that despite uh, a, an upper respiratory swab, a sputum culture, a blood culture, and urine serologies, no pathogen was detected in 62% of patients that clearly had a pneumonia on a chest X-ray. So I don't think I have to motivate for you that the most common scenario in treating patients up front is not knowing whether a bacterial or a viral infection may be present. And this sort of drives home the point. Bacteremia diagnostics are not sepsis diagnostics. Bacteremia forms only a small subset of patients with sepsis. And even patients with sepsis are really only a small subset of the patients that need good sepsis diagnostics, which is those suspected of sepsis. Patients may have non-severe infections, they may have non-infectious inflammation, and we use a battery of tests to evaluate them. Sure, vitals and physical exam, but it's also, of course, the CDC, lactate, maybe procalcitonin, microbiology, imaging, serologies, et cetera. And most of the time, we really don't know whether or not a patient has an infection. So how do we consider diagnosing sepsis? Well, sepsis really has two axes. 
This was put together most notably by Hallie Prescott et al. Uh, in the Annals of the ATS in 2018. She considered two axes, one being the likelihood of bacterial infection here on the y-axis and the severity of illness or the risk of death on the x-axis. Clearly it's true that somebody with a very severe illness, things like shock, altered mentation, lactic acidosis, or respiratory failure, and a reasonably high likelihood of bacterial infection deserve antibiotics uh, within an hour. On the other hand, patients without a high risk of death uh, where there's just a high likelihood of bacterial infection deserve targeted antibiotics after obtaining information to guide antibiotic selection. And other folks that are sort of in the middle, where there's a moderate risk of an infection and a moderate risk of severity, probably deserve antibiotics just within three hours, eventually targeted to site, if possible. Whereas, of course, patients who don't have a risk of either bacterial infection or death probably deserve a more intensive search for alternate diagnosis prior to starting any antibiotics at all. So, what's the power of the host response? Well, host response diagnostics is a solution to, to searching for sepsis because by reading patterns of mRNA from the blood, we can detect any infection, not just bloodstream infections. What do I mean by that? Well, as you can see from the little animation on the right, white blood cells, as you know, extravasate into infected tissues uh, and react to the pathogens there and then re-enter the bloodstream. Thus, we don't have to have a bloodstream infection in order to pick up signals of an infection anywhere in the body from the blood. We can just look at the white blood cells and determine First, whether or not they are reacting to an infection consult at all. Second, we can differentiate between bacterial and viral infections. Third, we can risk stratify sepsis since the white blood cells are really the driving component behind whether a patient turns septic. We can predict therapy response. And the last piece is we can make this run really quickly because white blood cells are highly abundant. It's relatively easy to measure their properties. Thus, we can leverage the evolution that comes along with white blood cells with modern technology to provide new kinds of clinical data um, to you. So how do the tests actually work? Well, mRNA patterns tell a story that we can read. On the left, you see evolutionary, evolutionarily conserved immune signaling. The idea is uh, a white blood cell, shown here in the dark blue in the middle, may react differently to something like gram-negative bacteria in the blue, gram-positive bacteria in the green, non-infectious insults in the yellow, or viruses in the red. They have a series of considerably expressed pattern recognition receptors on the cell surface that react to all of these things early on. That's what allows neutrophils and macrophages to react so quickly at the early insults of an infection. But each one of those slightly different kinds of insults leads to a slightly different downstream signaling pathway. And basically, the way host response testing works is we look at a certain pattern, a certain number of these mRNAs, and we look for these patterns. And together with machine learning, we can figure out what it was that activated the white blood cell in the first place. So, in other words, you could look at a pattern and say, oh, this is one that was activated by a bacterial infection, or this, this white blood cell has been activated in response to a viral infection. We can also look at these patterns and determine whether or not it's a pattern associated with a patient who's about to become septic or is in a very, very severe infectious illness. As a result, the host response test can possibly match clinical intuition. What we mean by that is host response tests can deliver three different kinds of scores. One is, is there a bacterial infection present? Another is, is there a viral infection present? And a third separate score is what's the severity risk? What's the 30-day mortality risk in this patient? So just like sepsis has two clinical axes shown here on the bottom left, again, hearkening back to Dr. Prescott's paper of, you know, is there an infection on the y-axis and is the patient very sick on the x-axis? Well, so can host response scores answer these questions. Is there a bacterial or viral infection on the y-axis separately from how sick is this patient on the x-axis? So, of course, if the host response told you there's a bacterial infection in the upper left, but a, a non-severe one, perhaps it's antibiotics and then maybe discharge. Whereas, of course, if it's a bacterial infection plus a high risk of mortality, that's a patient who deserves immediate broad-spectrum antibiotics and a trip to the ICU. How might these three host response scores come into your clinical practice? Let's say, for instance, you were in the emergency department and a patient came in presenting with a possible lower respiratory tract infection but no vital sign changes. You're thinking this patient might go home, but want to get some further information first. Well, host response testing might be able to tell you three things. For instance, in the top, it might say a bacterial infection is very likely, but a viral infection is unlikely and there's a low risk of mortality. Okay, this is a patient that deserves oral antibiotics and potentially to be sent home. Or perhaps the host response score comes back and says a bacterial infection is very unlikely, but the patient's at a moderate risk of a viral infection, again, with a low risk of mortality. 
maybe this is a patient that doesn't deserve antibiotics and can simply be sent home to recuperate at home. INSEP is one such test that is being built to leverage this host response information in a rapid manner. Our test is designed to help diagnosis in a busy emergency department with a turnaround time of about 30 minutes. For, for our test, each of these three scores, bacterial infection, viral infection, and 30-day mortality risk, is broken into highly actionable bands. And you can see we target sensitivities of around 97 to 99% at the low end and specificities of around 96 to 99% at the high end. Thus, when a test is negative, you should be fairly safe to choose not to treat with antibiotics, whereas the test can also be used for case finding, uh, able to rule in patients with a very high likelihood of a bacterial infection. INSEP has been tested in multiple prospective blinded studies. Here we have some data most recently published in Nature Communications. On the top row, you see 18 training cohorts. Uh, INSEP test had an AUROC, or uh, area under the re receiver operating characteristic curve, of 0.91, which translated in that study to a sensitivity of around 97% and a specificity of around 97%. But you can see that we've also shown, so far, in preliminary data, three external blind cohorts that upheld that same area under the ROC curve in an ICU in California, an emergency department in Greece, and an emergency department in Germany across a wide range of severities from just one SERS criteria to full patients with septic shock in the ICU. Each case confirming a sensitivity and specificity between 97 and 99% and a specificity between 96 and 99%. And for comparison, procalcitonin ZU rock is about 0.83 uh, in repeated meta-analyses. Outside of our test then, host response profiling may be the solution. The idea is that host response testing immediately when a patient comes into the emergency department can evaluate both severity and infection risk. Harkening back to our clinical decision from New England Journal of Medicine, imagine that the woman who presents with plus or quadrant pain shows up with a low risk of bacterial infection coupled with a low risk of, of um, illness severity. Well, this is a patient who's probably safe not to administer antibiotics and assume that the Presentation is related simply to constipation and urinary retention. Or imagine the host response testing tells you there's a reasonably high risk of a bacterial infection and a reasonably high risk of mortality. Okay, well, now you can administer antibiotics immediately, knowing that the potential risk of withholding therapy is high. Thanks for your attention. I'll note that you can find out more about the INSEP test at inflammatics.com. And of course, in our next webinar in two weeks, we'll continue our series on host response profiling in the emergency department. Please also follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. And if you want further information, you can email us at info at inflammatics.com. Thank you.